Thanks to Kara for sponsoring this video. Let's take a trip back in time to the year 2011. I'm in the Ghost Adventures fandom. <laughs> Just over a decade ago, I was in the Ghost Adventures fandom. I mean, what can I say? The show has an allure. And most of it is the dozens of questions that I have surrounding Zachary Bagels as a person. Post captures a small unexplained stick figure standing on top of me. And very soon after this, something seems to overtake me. What? I'll talk more about the show later on in this video. I promise it's relevant. But I've been interested in ghosts my whole life. In fact, I've even had a few paranormal experiences of my own. In high school, a friend and I honestly caught a really good EVP while lurking in a supposedly haunted lot near our school. We're there, we, all, we went all the way down. There was literally no one else there, and neither of us said go back. So who said it. Of course, evidence like the EVP that we caught or things like ghost photos or electromagnetic energy readings are hard proof of spirits to some and hokey nonsense to others. If you're a fan of Ryan Bergara and Shane Madej's antics on BuzzFeed and Solve Supernatural, you're familiar with both camps on the Are Ghosts Real issue. I'm gonna take everything said by a ghost hunter with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. Well, technically now you're a ghost hunter, so think about that. Oh shit. But ghost hunting itself is not a new phenomenon at all. And people have obviously believed in ghosts or spirits since, well, the dawn of humanity. But why? And why are we so desperate to find proof, so much so that ghost hunting itself has now become a multi-million dollar industry? Come learn with me. <laughs> Quick disclaimer first. Firstly, this video will mainly focus on the US. Other parts of the world have super rich and amazing ghost hunting histories that I just don't have time to get into here. Also, if discussions that really dissect the ghost hunting genre are really likely to piss you off, or if you really just don't want to hear the research and discussion of anyone skeptical of paranormal investigation and ghostly evidence, then this is absolutely not the video for you. I'm saving your precious time. Just click away now. <laughs> because yeah, I'm gonna be ripping into some things. Did you leave yet? No? Okay, awesome. So before we get into it, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Care Of. I am notoriously bad at taking care of my health. So I'm really excited that Care Of is today's sponsor because they've made it a complete no brainer for me to be able to keep track of my daily supplements. Care Of is a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamins to your door every month. All you have to do is complete their super straightforward quiz to lay out your health goals and needs. And they curate a list of recommended vitamins and supplements for you to choose from. And then each month they arrive on your doorstep in this super convenient packaging and your daily dosage is in these little compostable packages. From the list they gave me, I chose what I already knew that I needed, a daily probiotic, vitamin C, astaxanthin for healthy skin, brain, and heart, and rhodiola for my stress, which is really helping me keep on top of the needs that I have. They also have these really convenient probiotic and immunity sticks in case you need something on the go or if you're traveling. I've been using this for a few weeks now and it's genuinely made it so much easier for me to keep up with my health. It just kind of takes the overthinking out of it and I don't need to worry about rounding up a million separate bottles and containers. One of my biggest goals for 2022 was taking better care of myself, so this is really helping. And I love that I can trust that the vitamins are made with good ingredients and that the subscription service is so easy to adjust based on my needs, whether they change or not. Visit the link in the description box to take the quiz to find out what's recommended for you and use my code CAS50 for 50% off your first order. Thank you so much to Kara for sponsoring this video. And now let's get back to learning the history of ghost hunting. By the way, Tutter is here. He's hiding behind me. That's better. Ghosts as a concept and ghost stories for that matter date back as far as any oral or written stories that we have. And the idea of what a ghost even is isn't standard throughout time and location. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, ghosts are something in between human and creature. In the Middle Ages, oftentimes ghosts came in the form of reanimated corpses or apparitions of holy figures. In the Jacobian era, ghosts were demons in disguise. Chinese folklore has a huge variety of types of ghosts from hungry ghosts to trickster ghosts to ghosts simply looking for offerings. In ye old ancient Roman times, Pliny the Younger wrote in one of his letters the story of a house that was haunted by a disheveled, starving man bound in chains. After years of vacancy, a philosopher named Athenodorus rented the home and waited one night to see the ghost while he did some work. When the ghost finally appeared, Athenodorus was like, Man, Dude, if I was that ghost, I'd be so pissed. <laughs> well, eventually he finished his work and the ghost led him outside, where in the morning, Athenodorus dug up a chained skeleton. He gave the ghost a proper burial and the ghost moved on to wherever ghosts go. Well, that's the big question, isn't it? At the core of our obsession with ghosts, there lies the real problem. 
What happens to us after we die? So many of us want to believe that we don't simply stop, you know, cease to exist. It's a comforting thought for many and terrifying for others. A lot of folks who fervently believe in ghosts are the latter, but regardless, this is the question that humans have struggled with for millennia because we don't have an answer. And ghost stories seem to give us one. And ghost sightings are supposedly the backbone of these stories. They also give us a sort of tangible connection to the humans of the past, something that most people crave, consciously or not. Colin Dickey writes in Ghostland, In a world where nearly every moment of our lives is photographed, recorded, and documented, the gaps in the past still beckon us. Searching for ghosts can be an attempt to reconstruct what is lost. By sifting through time for stories that have been misplaced or forgotten, we listen to the voices that call out to be remembered. Our ghost stories centered on unfinished endings, broken relationships, things left unexplained. They offer an alternative kind of history, foregrounding what might otherwise be ignored. We all want to be remembered, to have our wishes and duties completed before we pass on, to die the good death. Ghosts act as two different opposing concepts. They remind us both that the bad death exists that we may pass on with unfinished business, doomed to never find peace, and they also give us the hope that these issues can be solved after death too, that some kind person can come along and put our spirits to rest. There is of course no shortage of media surrounding this idea of the haunted hero with the curse of mediumship. One TV show that was extremely formative to me as a kid was The Ghost Whisperer, starring Jennifer Love Hewitt. The show ran from 2005 to 2010 and follows a character named Melinda Gordon, who was born with the ability to see ghosts. She lives in a cute, picturesque town that definitely isn't the set from Back to the Future, and runs an antique store with her best friend, which honestly gave me highly unrealistic expectations for my adult life. So each episode basically has Melinda being confronted by a new ghost, gasping a lot, and wearing shirts with dangerously plunging necklines and doing some sleuthing and pestering grieving strangers so she can figure out why this ghost is trapped on Earth and trying to solve whatever their issue is so the ghost can go into the light. And if the ghost doesn't want to go into the light, they become an evil ghost. The lore got even more and more convoluted over time, and in my opinion, the show jumped the shark when her creepy son was born, but you get the idea. <laughs> This type of plotline where some living person is cursed with the duty to help the dead find peace is extremely common. You see it in other types of media too, like Bleach or the novel Cemetery Boys, which is extremely good if you're looking for a book to read. They all focus on a person haunted by spirits, often fighting time to save the dead before they turn into a malevolent spirit. It makes complete sense why this concept is so popular. It gives us this dreamy idea that there's people out there who can help us even after death when we are helpless and it also explains why there are good and bad ghosts or why good ghosts may do bad things. It's also a really attractive concept for writers because, well, it's really fun and inherently interesting to have a sort of tortured protagonist doomed to help the wayward spirits because no one else can. I get it. <laughs> My own webcomic, Cunning Fire, has this exact type of protagonist too, and one of the characters is the literal spirit of death, plus the antagonist is literally just a glorified and really stupid poltergeist. <laughs> Looks like all that ghost media I grew up with was more formative than I realized. But this specific storyline as a trope is only new in a few ways. The basis of it, that being a person acting as a bridge between the realms of the living and the dead is an extremely old concept, and not just in fiction. Centuries ago in the Middle Ages, this might have come in the forms of saints and holy men and women making spiritual contact with biblical figures, more acting as prophets than anything else. Later centuries saw people taking a more proactive approach. In the 1600s, a vicar named Joseph Glanville began pursuing his supernatural beliefs that ghosts could be used to prove the existence of God. This was an era where atheism was rising among the population, and there was a lot of worry that the common open mockery of religion would result in a greater spiritual catastrophe. Glanville believed that proving the existence of ghosts, therefore, in his eyes, proving God's existence would solve the problem. Of course, we still have atheists and ghost hunters desperately searching for proof today, so I think it goes without saying that Glanville was unsuccessful. We don't see anyone who could be truly dubbed a ghost hunter again until well into the Victorian era, and that's when things start to get really spicy on the spiritual front. <laughs> The 
Victorian era was a hotbed for interest in spirits and the paranormal for a number of reasons. For one thing, it was a period of unbelievable technological advancements, though today we don't tend to realize it. It was the era with the invention of the radio, the telegraph, steamboats, cars, trains, photography, modern bicycles, electric lighting, the telephone, x-rays, medical antiseptics, the sewing machine, paved roads, typewriters, recorded sound and film, and much, much more. And many of these inventions, photography, electricity, and recorded sound in particular, completely altered the spiritual landscape for many people. For one thing, new electricity in homes often made strange sounds, smells, or flashes that people weren't used to and may have chalked up to the paranormal. But photography and sound recording saw something far more cataclysmic. It made the dead, in a way, undead. In the past, the dead were gone and lived only in memory. Perhaps you had their writings or a painting or drawing of them, but never before could the exact image and voice of a deceased person exist beyond the grave. John Peters told the Distillations podcast, In a sense, all recording media are cemeteries. The idea that you could record the dead, their minds, their thoughts, their words, their deeds, to live on is a very ancient one. So if you read Homer, he's singing the praises of great deeds on the battlefield of Achilles, for example, but writing does not preserve the voice of the dead. It preserves the words of the dead, and there's a profound difference. And the idea that we could suddenly know what someone sounds like and keep hearing their voice after they were dead seemed particularly haunting. Previously, to hear the voice of a dead person was the domain of magic, or sorcery, or something weird and haunted. So you can see how the phonograph has this patina of the uncanny. When Thomas Edison invented his phonograph in 1878, it was described in the Scientific American as making speech immortal. And it's true, but it didn't just make speech immortal. In a huge way, it made people immortal. The phonograph and commercialization of photography came on the heels of the Civil War, which took the lives of over 700,000 people. So many people died out in the open and laid in plain sight unburied for weeks or longer. Death was always visible for Victorians. Disease killed so many more people then than it does now. But the brutality of the war was something that tore through the lives of every American to so much higher a degree, so much so that traditional ways of mourning and rationalizing death were failing. People struggled to come to terms with the loss and the trauma and craved something, anything, that could connect them to their dead loved ones. And people like mediums and spirit photographers gave people exactly what they wanted. Spirit photography happened completely by accident the first time. William Mumler was working in his studio taking self-portraits when, upon developing one of them, the image came to life showing the spirit of his long-deceased cousin behind him, a girl made of light. He was startled until he realized his mistake. He had accidentally reused an old plate that already had a photo on it, so what resulted was a double image. He he showed the photo to a friend who was a spiritualist who took it very seriously and said that it was absolutely the real image of a ghost. The photo began to circulate, usually embellished in the papers with grim details such as that Mumler's arm felt numb while sitting for the photo, or he could only take a few photos at a time before becoming exhausted from the strain of connecting to the spirit world. People were eating it up, and Mumler was more than willing to cash in on the craze. This began in 1861, just at the very beginning of the Civil War. Over the course of his career as a spirit photographer, more and more people were losing their loved ones to the violence, and they craved seeing their lost person so much, so desperate for a connection with someone they'll never see again. People were more than willing to pay the extraordinarily high price of over $10 per photo that Mumler charged. In today's money, that's over $300 per photo. His career didn't last long, though. In 1863, a man sat for Mumler, and when the photo was developed, he recognized the ghost as a very much alive man that he knew. Mumler was sued, sparking a media circus, and was eventually acquitted, but it was too late. His reputation now was truly in the grave. But Mumler's success spawned a ton of imitators. Spirit photography was extraordinarily easy to do, and the demand was very high. And grieving people weren't just in the market to see their dead loved ones in photos. They wanted to hear and speak to them, too. The Victorian era saw a ton of women who became famous mediums, or people who could speak to the dead, or otherwise had some connection to the spirit world. The most famous of this time was the case of the Fox 
half-sisters. In 1847, the Fox family moved to a home in Hydesville, New York. It wasn't long before the daughters Margarita, Kate, and Maggie started hearing strange knocking sounds in the house at night. They finally called out, asking who it was making the sounds, and apparently they got answers back from a ghost they called Mr. Splitfoot. They communicated with Mr. Splitfoot in something very similar to the newly invented Morse code. One knock for yes, two knocks for no. Mr. Splitfoot was giving very specific answers, so people started to really believe that this was real. After the papers later reported that the Fox family had dug up Mr. Splitfoot's body on their property, P.T. Barnum, the circus villain, decided to give the girls a job at his new American museum where they would hold seances for pay. And the Fox sisters became massive celebrities, which of course earned them a lot of hate. Their career didn't last after a commission of skeptics investigated them and published the declaration that their whole shtick was a hoax. Maggie Fox, who was an alcoholic, went on to publish a tell-all in the paper about how they made the noises happen by cracking their toe joints, and the sisters died in poverty. But they weren't alone in this. The skeptic scientists in this era had it out for the spiritualists. Not all scientists were skeptics looking to ruin careers or lives, though. In fact, many Victorian scientists saw a lot of value in honestly investigating the paranormal. This is in part because the massive shift in Victorian people's idea of how the natural world works as new inventions revolutionized daily life. Radio itself actually brought an entirely new realm of thought to the the world of science, the concept of the ether. People talked about radio waves as tangibly traveling through space through a sort of parallel, quite literally ethereal plane, both our physical space and not. It was the idea that the ether is what carries electricity, light, and radio waves, and heat, etc. And the ether is also what carries spirit energy, or where spirits live. This gave many researchers a huge interest in studying the ether and ghosts in general as a real scientific scientific possibility and marked the beginning of combining technology with the idea of hunting for ghosts. There was a new faction of science emerging called Psychical Research, which sought to explore the properties of the ether. They really believed that there may actually be a scientific way to make contact between the living and the dead. In the US, the key figure in psychical research was a man named William James, often dubbed the father of American psychology. In 1884, James founded the Society for Psychical Research, which sought to investigate scientifically anything paranormal. Their special interest was proving the existence of telepathy. James became sort of obsessed with a famous Boston woman named Leonora Piper, who claimed that she heard the voices of the dead and could communicate with them through automatic writing, which is where the sitter goes into a trance and the spirit moves their hand to write a message. James paid for a sitting with Piper and she was able to tell him highly specific information about his family that no stranger would know. And from that moment on, he was convinced that she did have some unexplained gift. He began to study her and put her through tests like having her identify random people after only touching like a lock of their hair that they donated, and she passed every single test. One of James's skeptic colleagues, a man named G. Stanley Hall, was not buying it though. He put Piper through tests of his own, doing anything he could to try and break her trance. It was honestly more like torture though. The tests had her burned, pinched, had bitter things forced in her mouth, had her tied up, things that left scars behind. And yet, despite all this, they weren't able to break her trance even once. To this day, no one really knows what was really happening with Leonora Piper and her gift. Unlike most other mediums, which did turn out to be frauds, no one was able to debunk her. And mediums weren't the only ways people were making alleged tangible contact with the dead. This era marks the beginning of modern day ghost hunting too. The first modern celebrity ghost hunter as we think of them now was an Englishman named Harry Price. Now, Price was a generally extremely unlikable person by most people who knew him, but the public loved him because Harry became famous for viciously trying to debunk mediums and being a skeptic against any hocus pocus, a thing that over time became more and more of a character act. He once said, people don't want the debunk, they want the bunk. And I mean, yeah. People love an unhinged skeptic. 
skeptic, especially if it doesn't spoil the fun of the magic of it all. Skeptics themselves add a kind of excitement to the paranormal. It gives the whole question bigger stakes, doesn't it? Price spent his career not necessarily looking to prove or disprove ghosts themselves, but was sort of in the middle. He debunked a lot of so-called mediums and spirit photographers, but at the end of the day, there were some hauntings and mediums he couldn't explain away. One of them was the case of Borley Rectory, often dubbed the most haunted house in England, especially after Price wrote a book on it titled The Most Haunted House in England. <laughs> While investigating Borley Rectory, which is reportedly haunted by a malevolent nun, Price and a number of witnesses that he hired would experience strange sounds, cold spots, objects that moved on their own or appeared and disappeared, wall writings, strange lights, and even full-blown apparitions. Given that the group of witnesses was made up of a mix of believers, skeptics, and avid debunkers, and many of these phenomena were experienced by numerous people at once, it's definitely strange. In the end, no one could come to a conclusion as to what was going on at Borley Rectory, and the case remains unsolved. But what became more and more prominent over the years following Price's career is the way that theology, the paranormal, and science have collided in a way that could only have existed in the post-industrial era. Ghost hunting as it exists today lies somewhere in the crossroads in between faith and secular science. In a way, as paranormal investigation becomes more and more intertwined with technology and research, the more it circles right back around to the ideas that Glanville had in the 17th century, using proof of ghosts to indirectly prove the existence of God. But much of the technology used to find this proof is inherently inconclusive. One of the most common tools that ghost hunters use today is an EMF reader or electromagnetic field reader. And one of the most common ones that people use is the K2, which can be bought on Amazon and was popularized by the show Ghost Hunters, a show well known for its reliable evidence. But the K2 is an extremely inaccurate tool if you're looking for something specific. It only operates on one axis and is unshielded, which means you have to wave it around. And it can be set off by almost anything from a cell phone to a computer mouse. There's also the ever popular spirit box, which loudly scans through AM and FM frequencies the hopes that you're able to pick out some sort of coherent voice. Personally, I still think that Spaghetti and Apple Tater from BuzzFeed Unsolved are the most solid ghost evidence we'll ever get, but... <laughs> Tell us your name. Apple Tater. Apple Tater? <laughs> Investigators also use the old tried and true tools like a simple camera or voice recorder. The evidence that comes out of this technology is almost entirely interpretive though, and oftentimes people's paranormal experiences are interpretations from the failure or ambiguity of something going on with a piece of technology. Camera batteries randomly die? Ghost. Audio breaks up? Ghost. Blur on a photo? Ghost. White noise? Ghost. You can't exactly prove it is really a ghost, but you can't always prove that it isn't either. Some cases became famous, like the incident in the 1950s when three children on Long Island were watching TV when when suddenly a frightening face of a ghostly woman appeared on the screen and wouldn't go away. It only disappeared when the TV itself later broke, and by this point, the media was having a field day with it. Much in the same way that people go nuts when someone thinks that they see the image of Jesus burn into their toast or something. <laughs> so even with the modern advancements in the more recent decades of ghost hunting tech and theory, a lot of it is never able to actually concretely produce definitive proof, and a lot of that is by design, which we'll get more into here in a minute. A lot of the time, these new methods of a paranormal investigation ask the practitioner and the onlooker to already be believers. Like, they already believe in ghosts, so they're already inclined to believe that these methods work and have solid theory behind them. But that doesn't stop many paranormal investigators from going to great lengths to explain the scientific theory behind their tools and practice. Practice. David M. Roundtree wrote an entire highly detailed book on it. In it, he says that ghosts could be a number of things time anomalies, beings from parallel dimensions, wormhole phenomena, etc. I mean, sure, I guess any one of those things could be true, right? It would be obscenely cocky to think that we as a civilization are currently so advanced that we can definitively say yes or no to any of these things. We're learning new things about the universe every day. But ghost hunting shows themselves never just relegate themselves to the world of science. That would, after all, be boring to most. So most, if not all of them, instead prefer to lay in the realm of adventure true crime storytelling with a side order of science LARPing. <laughs>
Now, as I said before, I used to be in the Ghost Adventures fandom. I bought and read Zach Bagan's first autobiography, I saw every episode premiere for a number of years, I bought merch, everything. I was eating it up, and you know what? That show is fun as hell. I mean, Ghost Adventures brought to the table what a lot of other ghost shows were lacking and wouldn't gain again until, well, maybe BuzzFeed Unsolved, and that is humor. What made Ghost Adventures so attractive to viewers wasn't just how convincing a lot of their evidence may have been, it was also how goddamn funny they are. Do you know how silly it is watching this totally jacked dude with a haircut that he calls the Zack Finn running around old buildings in the dark going, dude, did you hear that? And as soon as someone else talks, he's like, shh. And then he makes poor anxiety-ridden Aaron Goodwin go by himself into the worst parts of the building, like a blood offering. <sighs> It's hysterical. For a while, they also uploaded a lot of little vlogs to YouTube where they'd just generally goof off, like Zack's hair tutorial. And the show's early seasons have no shortage of, in my opinion, iconic moments. The time Zack got possessed. The time Zack's ass got slapped by a ghost. I just felt someone grab my ass. What? Like hard, Nick. The time Zack wrote a love poem to a ghost and then busted his ass on the ice. The time Zack joked about wanting to bang the ghost. The scene on Snake Hill. You want to suck the venom out of me? I don't want to suck anything out of you. Of course, the vibes of the show have changed quite a bit over the years. It's gotten kind of more serious and one of the members left the show. Now Zack talks to celebrities about hokey Dybbuk boxes and beefs with Annabelle the doll on Twitter. And Ghost Avengers itself is a really good example of how hyper-masculinized the genre has become. It's not enough to hunt ghosts, you need a team of buff, rough and tough bros imprisoning themselves in the darkness, acting as aggressors towards the ghosts a lot of the time. In the past, spiritualism was the realm of women. Women were the ones making contact and speaking to the ghosts, often teenage girls. Today, most ghost hunting teams on TV are made up of men who think that fear is girly, engage in self-sacrifice by investigating at all, describing the locations they enter as deeply dangerous, not because the buildings are decrepit, but because a ghost might hurt them. Though that never really happens beyond some scratching or Zack getting spanked. I can feel like this on my, on my butt. Don't show me. These investigations are raw. Did someone just scratch me? Extreme. And so much more intense. It's almost as if there's an anxiety there beneath the surface that the genre that they're engaging in, which in the past was dominated by female mediums, beautiful gothic heroines, and supernatural romances targeted towards women, is inherently feminine, and now they need to overcompensate for it. Stereotypically, men are too logical and rational to be taken up by feminine mystical and paranormal beliefs. In one episode, Zack himself makes this extremely plain when he says to a witness, you look like kind of a tough guy. To me, it looks like it takes a lot to make you a believer in the paranormal. In another episode, after being terrified by something, he said, call me a vagina, but I'd like to get out of here. Oh. In earlier seasons, Zack would take his act of antagonizing ghosts and actively searching for the mean ones to extremes, which is something that he would later apologize for and has since changed his tune considerably. But at the end of the day, Zack is an entertainer. All of these people are. And the broification of the genre still stands. To me, he's great for comedic value. You really can't take his whole thing too seriously. Not only that, but Ghost Adventures and many other ghost-related reality TV shows offer a pretty poignant view of a unique style of people engaging with their spirituality. That's what modern ghost hunting still has in common with his past versions. Where interest in the paranormal ticked up after the Civil War as grief and trauma drove people to seek connection with the other side, the same thing happened after 9-11. The 2000s saw a dramatic rise in interest in the paranormal, not just as a genre of fiction, but as a potential reality. And it makes sense. For all their machismo and jokes and yelling, ghost reality media offers the viewer something like secondhand catharsis. Jessica O'Hara writes in Making Their Presence Known TV's Ghost Hunter Phenomenon in a Post World, the role of the ghost hunter is to recognize, acknowledge, and mourn the dead. Indeed, participants of the shows often speak back to the ghost by acknowledging the spirit's presence and the injustice they suffered or caused. Is somebody here with me? Can you tell me your name? Can you tell me who hurt you? These are questions asked at nearly every paranormal investigation. 
It's a deliberate continuation of the Victorian seance, but it's also a natural reaction for people to cry out and plead for a response from the invisible being that they aren't sure is really there. This is in part a symptom of the genre's unbreakable connection to religion and spiritualism, no matter how much technology and scientific theory they try to employ. Because religion itself, as something most viewers are already familiar with, gives people a framework to approach paranormal ideologies with that they might already believe. Shannon Dale writes, sorry, something fell in the background and scared the shit out of me. <laughs> oh, it's a ghost. Shannon Dale writes, the ghost hunters cannot rely on any form of consistent belief to support their findings, but they do attempt to use one of the most widespread pools of belief, that of contemporary Christianity. Religious beliefs are often tied to family values and a sense of safety from the other, which in this case is evil, or for the Ghost Adventures crew, malevolent spirits. Post 9-11 anxieties certainly encourage this othering, as well as the need to align oneself with the mainstream discourse that supports current power structures. These discourse alignments provide a sense of safety and stability within a concrete set of religious rules. Again, you don't really need to prove anything to people who already believe, right? The methods of paranormal investigation often mimic prayer in a way, or employ tools like holy water, or look at strange and confusing symbols, or really a lot of non-white cultural practices, and see it as signs of Satanism or demonic worship. And many people become paranormal investigators because it's a spiritual journey. The science and tech makes it feel more solid and legitimate, of course, but at its core, these are people with existential anxieties who want answers about what happens after we die. One investigator named Patty said, My faith is stronger that there is an afterlife. I always believed that we had a soul and it continued on after, but I guess before paranormal investigating, I was just like everyone else in organized religion. You go up to heaven, you play the harp all day or whatever. But over time, a lot of people involved in paranormal investigation find their spiritual beliefs expanding out of the religious thresholds that they previously had. Just like everyone else, it leaves them with more questions than answers. Sure, they capture some evidence per episode, though it's never enough to prove anything, no matter how many fancy new gadgets they buy or develop. Almost by design, not one of dozens or hundreds of these celebrity ghost hunters over the years has ever been able to produce evidence that finally puts to rest the are ghosts real question. And before you start yelling at me, listen, I also want to believe in ghosts. I'm on your side. <laughs> I even said at the beginning of this video that I've had spooky ooky ghost experiences and have caught what I think is pretty great ghost evidence. But that doesn't change the fact that people who set out to make a career on ghost hunting, more often than not, are entertainers first. They're here to tell a great story and keep you watching their show or hiring them. If they actually capture the one piece of evidence to rule them all, how can they possibly replicate that again in any satisfying way when no one has ever been able to do it even once before? The risks are super high, so it's understandable that they use tech that gives readings that might mean something is there, it's more interpretive. Or you catch an EVP that sounds like it's saying something, but it's really scratchy, so it's all up to interpretation, or you get weird marks on your skin, or you maybe saw something in the shadows. But it doesn't really go further. And you know what? Maybe we don't want it to. As John Peters told the Distillations podcast, the interpretive part of ghost hunting is exactly what makes it special. It seems to me that sometimes the psychical researchers and paranormal psychologists are really hoping they can get beyond interpretation and they're really hoping that they can find transmission or contact or connection or mind-to-mind -mind replication. I mean, that's kind of the holy grail, to try and find the ability to send a signal. And to me, just ethically, poetically, aesthetically, this just seems wrong-minded because it seems to underestimate the nature of the human condition, which is one of interpretation. And this is something to be happy about. It's a handsome fact of human life that we get to interpret. That isn't a fallen awful thing. I mean, that's what makes us human. Because at the end of it all, the best part of ghosts and the best part of paranormal investigation is that mystery. It's the fact that the question is unanswered. That's what makes it exciting or scary. And think about it, nearly everything in the natural world was historically something really confusing or scary to people until we figured out what it was and what made it happen. If ghosts do exist, 
Do you really want them to become something as explainable and benign as the weather? I think ghosts serve a greater purpose than that. I think that ghosts, more than anything, are reflections of human fear and guilt. Holland Dickey continues in Ghostland, We like to view this country as a unified, cohesive whole based on progress, a perpetual refinement of values, and an arc of history bending towards justice. But the prevalence of ghosts suggests otherwise. The ghosts who haunt our woods, our cemeteries, our houses, and our cities appear at moments of anxiety and point to instability in our national and local identities. Our country's ghost stories are themselves the dreams or nightmares of a nation, the Freudian slips of whole communities, uncomfortable and unbidden expressions of things that we'd assumed were long past and no longer important. If American history is taught to school children as a series of great striding benchmarks, the history of America's ghost stories is one of crimes left unsolved, or transgressions we now feel guilty about. They offer explanations for the seemingly inexplicable, address injustices after the fact, and give expression to our unstated desires and fears. This is likely part of the reason why some of the most popular and sensationalized haunted locations are former asylums and prisons, decrepit boarding schools, quarantine wards of decaying hospitals, places where we as a society failed our most vulnerable. These places, purely by existing, seem haunted by nature. We can't fathom the people who lived there having died the good death, because more often than not, they didn't. Too frequently, the suffering of the powerless was preventable, and because the past is the past, there's nothing we can do to change that except to go to these places and cry out into the ether for these spirits to speak back. Because maybe this time someone's listening. Thank you so much for joining me on this exploration of the history of the hunting of ghosts. I hope you didn't come away from this feeling like I've ruined the genre for you because I mean, I made this video because I love the paranormal and ghost hunting stuff. I think that thinking harder about these things leads to a greater appreciation, at least for me. So until next time, wash thy hands, wear thy mask, and let me know in the comments if you have any ghost experiences of your own. I love hearing them. Uh -huh.